and welcome to Riverside Baptist Church. And I hope you all are having a good day, and this is a start to a good week. I missed you guys last week, but uh, Amanda and the boys and I had a, a good vacation, and it was uh, very relaxing. Went to see my parents. The boys stayed with Grandma and Grandpa, and we went to the mountains for a couple of days and came back and visited family, and I just had a real nice time, but it's, it's glad, we're glad to be back and back home. Uh, by way of announcements, I uh, hope you noticed on the slideshow that we're having a work day. This is coming Saturday. Please be here at 8 o'clock uh, for a church work day. Uh, someone mentioned it's going to be hot next weekend. And, uh, that's probably true. We're still in August and the, uh, the deep part of summer. But the more people we have doing the work, we're faster than we get done with it. And the more fun we'll have working together. So please come out next Saturday morning, 8 o'clock. Then uh, next week, week from today, we got to vote on our uh, new church budget and officers for the upcoming church year. So next Sunday, right after service, just like we did for our deacons and Sunday school officers, we want to vote for the church budget and the church officers. So uh, all members, please be ready to stay next week after service. Uh, any other announcements? Uh, the Baptist Children's Home is doing their food roundup. Um, in September rather than the one that they would have had in April. Um, we want to open this up to anyone within the church that would like to donate food items, which we will have a list available as to their neediest items. Um, we will, the first three Sundays of September, we will be collecting the food items there will be a designated area in the fellowship hall where people can bring in, set their items down, and then move on into here for the service. That will be the first three Sundays. There will also be a box if anyone wants to put a gift card in there for them to use for items that are not stable, uh, shelf stable, or a check, however anyone wants to do it, then, um, then it will be carried over to the association office for pick up after that third Sunday of September. Just to make sure everybody heard, starting the first Sunday in September, for the first three Sundays total in September, we will be collecting uh, food items, non-perishable food items, there will be a place in the fellowship hall. Uh, if you don't want to do extra shopping, uh, but you want to give to the Baptist Children's Homes, you can give a gift card uh, or a check donation. Um, do you know if the checks are made out to Baptist Children's Homes or the Children's Association? Or? And normally it's the Baptist Children's Homes, okay. I believe. I will check the information and be sure of that by next Sunday. Yeah, we'll uh, double check. Mostly it's, it will be like a food line gift card, Sam's Club gift card, right. those things like that. So, so they can go and get the things they need that be perishable items or individual homes might need uh, different things. It's not just one place. We have I think 20 some children's homes across the state. Um, the closest one to us is in the Husky, but there are several across the state. So uh, gift cards, uh, to Sam's Club, to uh, Food Lion, places like that would be very welcome if you don't want to do extra shopping. Right? That helps the uh, orphan uh, children or children who have been taken from their families due to safety reasons or like the one in the Husky, uh, mothers who are struggling just to get back on their feet and they're there with their children. And so the children's home is helping the mothers uh, finish their GED or find jobs to get stable and self-sufficient so they can take care of their kids on their own. Um, they do a lot of good work, and uh, your donations are very appreciated. Anything else? Right. By way of prayer request, uh, I do want you to remember we do have uh, several unspoken who are still ongoing or waiting for the ongoing um, medical uh, tests and decisions, procedures coming up, and things of that nature. So please be in prayer for one another. Uh, my family's not here because starting yesterday we started feeling bad my stomach's been very unsettled and upset and amanda's had this massive sinus thing uh, pressure headache 
and some other body aches going on. No fever or nothing like that. I don't think it's a flu, but just that sinus pressure getting so tight that you feel your teeth and they start hurting kind of thing. Uh, so please be in prayer for us and uh, we'll be in prayer for you guys. Any other updates or praise reports? Melissa. Again, to make sure y'all heard, pray for uh, the schools and everybody involved and however schools are reopened, of course the students, but also the faculty and staff, uh, teachers and other support staff that are, are there on the students, uh, but schools who are going back live and uh, plenty of schools are doing virtual, at least for a short time, maybe for uh, half a year or longer. Uh, they're kind of having to wing it, uh, so pray for them to have wisdom and pray for them to have uh, health and safety. Else. The family of Virgil Frazier, he, Virgil passed away yesterday. His son um, was the um, contractor that did our new front doors back here recently. family of Virgil, Virgil Frazier. Anybody else? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Holy Father God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you for this day you have given us uh, the start of a new week and we pray Lord that you would help us to use this time specifically here to gather and worship and use all of this week that you give us to glorify your name and to be obedient to your will. Holy God, I ask you to, to be here in a way that we can know we've met with you and worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. Holy Spirit, I ask you to open up your word to our minds and to our hearts, that we will hide your word in our hearts and live it out through our actions and our words. I pray, Holy One, that you would be with this, uh, the Fraser family. Lord, we know that grief, uh, the loss of a loved one, is a very difficult time. We pray, Holy God, that you would just bless them and comfort them. We pray that you would give them the peace that goes beyond understanding. And we ask you, Lord, that if any of his family does not know you, that this would be a wake-up call and make them think about their mortality and think about eternity. And we pray, Lord, that they would become right with you before it's their time to leave this world. I ask you, Lord, to be with those that we know who are, have upcoming uh, doctor's appointments and tests and maybe procedures or, or waiting to find out if they need procedures. Lord, we, all, we know several who just have ongoing health issues and they, they're in a struggle to, uh, to do what they would like. Uh, they're in a struggle to change uh, because they can't keep doing what they always have been. And so we pray that you would give them wisdom and comfort in their bodies as well as comfort and peace in their hearts. I ask you, Lord, to be with our teachers, our students, uh, faculty, staff, administrators, and all those who are involved in uh, opening up schools or doing school online. Lord, it's always a difficult thing to start a new year, but now, uh, and this year, it's just even more chaotic and confusing, and everything seems varied. And Lord, we pray that you would give them guidance, give the decision makers wisdom and the right decision and let the students learn more and grow as they can in the places they have available to them. We ask you these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh
salvation, describing our call, talking very theologically, and now in chapter 4 he's moving to a very practical aspect, and he says as a transition, in a, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. So Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 1, I'm reading from the English Standard Version because it keeps a play on words that uh, Paul has in the Greek. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, 
in love. And we talked last week about humility. Today we want to talk about gentleness. And I wanted, uh, so I want first to make sure that you guys remember that when he says to walk worthy, he is in no means saying that we become worthy of the great gift of salvation. God did not look down the path of time into the future to say, wow, you know, John became a really great guy, so he's worthy of me saving because he's going to do great things once I save him. It's not how it works. We never earn it. It's a free gift. We are saved by grace through faith. And Paul makes this very explicit in the early chapters of this book. What he's saying here is that we need to respond to that offer of salvation and then live in a worthy manner of that offer. We got to treat it like the great gift that it is, and we got to sincerely then live our life to keep that commitment we make to Christ in accepting His lordship and His salvation over our lives. So He's saying here in the practical part of the book, this is how we should walk. This is how we should live in accordance to the calling by which we have been called. God has called us to a life with Him, and this is what that life looks like. First, humility. And we talked about how none of us are better than anybody else. And we shouldn't think of ourselves as better than. Uh, and to keep it about ourselves in remembrance of who we were before Christ saved us. Not in a sense to keep guilt heaping on ourselves and feel like we never overcome that sin nature. But remember that we were all sinners. That Christ overcame the sin nature in us. And it is not through our own ability or righteousness. We need to keep a lowly view of ourselves. And that helps us do the second thing he mentioned here, to be gentle. The Hebrew word, I'm sorry, the Greek word for gentle is preta, pretes. And it is synonymous, according to the lexicons and dictionaries I saw, uh, it was synonymous with meekness. Uh, one dictionary pointed out that when Jesus said in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the meek because they will inherit the earth. That word for meek is a synonym here for this word for gentle. So when Paul says gentle, he means this kind of meekness, a sense of uh, consideration of others and a putting yourself in a lower position than them. So we see how it goes hand in hand with humility. It is a willingness to yield to what the other needs rather than what I need or I want. Learning about this definition of gentleness, because I think of gentle, I think of someone very soft-spoken, Someone who's very, uh, almost, honestly, it seems like in our standard, it goes hand in hand with shyness and uh, underconfidence and almost a, a bad self-image. But Paul in the Bible is not telling us to have unhealthy mental habits or unhealthy self-image. Jesus was mental. He's the manliest man you ever want to meet. He complete mastery over himself and his situation. Uh, he was a carpenter. He was tough. He was strong. But he was meek and he was gentle. And he let them lead him like a lamb to slaughter when he died for our sins. So Paul was saying here, not a, a shy, overly submissive meekness, but a gentleness that considers others. A gentleness that makes you consider yourself secondary to others. And consider others. And when I learned this definition of meekness, it made me think of a, a lady and a story I heard about her from my old church. One of my uh, deacons at my old church, uh, he loved to tell this story. And I think it exemplifies his gentleness. He and his wife were driving back home into churches between wherever they were and their house. And their younger son, Caleb, got sick. That motion sick car sick in the car. And he threw up in the car. Battle scene. So the church was closer to the home. They poured in the parking lot of the church. They, they get him to the bathroom so he can you know, kind of take care of himself, wash his face, rinse his mouth out. And this lady, Jean, was there at the church because she was the custodian. She was cleaning the church. And they, they rush in with Caleb and tell her what happened. And you know, excuse us, Jean, we got to use the bathroom, sorry. And she stops what she's doing and goes out to their car and cleans up his vomit. And he comes back in and finishes cleaning the church. Now, no one had ever asked her to do that. And the boy never would dream of asking someone else to do that. But when I learned this definition of gentleness, I think Gene right there fit that perfectly. 
Because that is a very lowly, meek job, isn't it? You moms, have you ever felt high and mighty cleaning up your baby's throw up? You, you can't. You know, if you guys know any nurses, they can't feel super superior to the world while they're helping you know, bathe their patients, helping them go to the bathroom, helping them clean up whatever they've got to clean up. You know, it's a lowly, often thankless job. And she didn't expect things. But she lowered herself. And she was also considerate. What did those parents need right then? They needed to help their son feel better. They needed to get him in to a restroom to finish what he had to do, wash his mouth out, feel a little bit better than he needed to get him home so he could get some Pepto, lay down, whatever he needed to do to feel better. And she knew that taking time to clean up the car, which we'd have to do before he get home, because the smell would make it worse. She considered what they needed and what that boy needed. And so she acted in a gentle way to them, humbly, neatly serving them, considering them before considering herself, yielding to them and their need. It took time out of her day. It took her away from what she had to do. It was never any part of her job description. No one would have thought twice if she just kept on doing her job and they had to take care of themselves. But she was gentle. See, gentleness is more than just the opposite of violence. It's a whole mindset about how you interact with, how you think about other people. It's a mindset that means we give them the benefit of the doubt when they do something we don't understand. It means we don't assume the worst about others. We try to consider their point of view, their situation. It's a mindset and attitude that comes out in our voice and our conversation with them. What do we call them? How do we talk about them? How do we talk to them? We'll be affected by our gentleness. As will our mindset, as will our actions. It impacts all parts of our life. See, the Bible talks about gentleness many times. I've already mentioned how Jesus was gentle. Uh, the Proverbs, Proverbs 15, 1 says a gentle answer turns away wrath. How many times have you seen it with people where someone is angry, is frustrated, maybe you've seen it in, in your home life, you know, one of you comes home from work and you're frustrated with whatever else ha happened outside the home and it kind of makes you snappish to your spouse or your kids and they snap back and they get all defensive and it just becomes this argument and a tense night and a bad time. But if we come home and we're, we're tense and we're kind of moody and we snap and someone Jimmy says, I understand you're upset, I understand you're frustrated, but I don't think it's that mean because I haven't done anything today. This is the first time we've seen each other today. What really happened? Why are you feeling so bad? Let's talk about it. It can de-arm and defuse that angry situation and it removes that tension. A gentle word turns away wrath. A gentle tongue can break a bone, Proverbs 25, 15. Uh, not in one go, but a gentle word can, uh, you can beat them with kindness. You can kill them with love, so to speak. Overcome adversity, not by repaying evil for evil, but repaying evil for good. If you remember the story of Elijah, when Elijah was on the run from Queen Jezebel, he was in the cave and he heard the, the earthquake and the thunder and he saw the fire. And remember in 2 Kings, God wasn't in the thunder, the earthquake, the fire, all these loud and, and very dramatic things. But it says in, oh, I have it. First Kings, I'm sorry, First Kings 19, that he then heard a still small voice, God's still small voice. Some translators rendered that a gentle whisper. God himself is gentle to us. Gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.23 Paul tells Timothy, gently instruct your opponents. That's foreign to us nowadays. We want to outshout them, our enemies. We want to, to win the argument. We want to prove we're right. We want to shout them down and put them in their place with some wonderful clever bit of logic or evidence or rhetoric or a meme on Facebook 
But Paul says if you have to, if you have an opponent, instruct him gently. If you need to correct a brother who has gone wayward in sin, restore him with gentleness. Galatians 6 1. 2 Corinthians, Paul appealed to the Corinthian Christians by the humility and gentleness of Christ. Jesus said about himself, not ironically, he's, he's the only one in the world who can get away with it. I am meek, again, synonym for gentle, and my burden is light. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Because he is gentle. And of course, the ultimate example is when he let them take him to the Roman court. Let them whip him, beat him, mock him, and then crucify him. Isaiah predicted centuries before it happened that he would be like a lamb led to the slaughter. Sorry about that. He would be like a lamb led to the slaughter. Gentle. Not fighting. Not trying to oppose it. We have a song I love to sing on Easter time. He could have called 10,000 angels to defeat his enemies, to free him from that crucifixion, that painful, agonizing death. But he gently laid down his life to pay the price for your sin and my sin so that we may have a place in his kingdom. Now you may say, preacher, Jesus wasn't always gentle. You're right. He wasn't. But before we get quick to try to justify our ungentleness, let's look at when Jesus was not gentle. We don't see an example of him being angry or ungentle with lost sinners who are acting like lost sinners. The tax collectors, the prostitutes, the heathen, the sinners that the Jewish leaders identified as the bad people. Jesus got righteous, holy, righteously angry at priests and Pharisees and Bible teachers and people who try to sell things and do their business in ways that interrupted other people from worshiping. So Jesus wasn't always gentle, but it wasn't with those people out there. The most, most of the time, all the times I can remember in Scripture, when He is harsh, He's speaking to religious people. So we must be the most careful in the way we respond to His salvation, to His calling to be one of His. Are we walking in a worthy manner or not? The last hymn for this morning is It Is Well With My Soul. It's one of my favorites, uh, one of my dad's favorites. He always said, play this at my funeral. If I don't get up and shout amen, then you know I'm really going. <laughs> I'm shouting it up there because I can't shout it down here. What I want to ask as we enjoy this hymn, are you sure that it's well with your soul? Have you accepted that free offer of salvation that he gently made to give to you, to offer you? Have you accepted it and brought Him into your life as Lord and Savior so He is ruling you and you are walking according to His path, not according to your own ways? Walking according to His path is a humble walk, a gentle walk, but it's also a joyful walk because you know you are right with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. If you're not walking that path, maybe you never started or maybe you've strayed from it, you're going to come and get right with God through Jesus Christ. Please come and pray while we listen to It Is Well With My Soul.